Okay, good morning. Um, I hope everyone can hear me. Um, please put in the chat if there are any problems with sound. Um, welcome to Portraits of Crime, the ethics of displaying real lives and people. So I'm Angie Sutton Vane, and I'm going to be co-chairing with Heather Shaw this morning. So just briefly to give you some background information, understanding British portraits and the Crime and Punishment Collections Network there are both subject specialist networks. And these were networks conceived originally by Arts Council England um, in order to provide specialist support and information to those working or using quite diverse question, uh, collections. And I'm just thinking off the top of my head, some other uh, SSNs are um, medical museums and maritime museums. So today, bringing these two networks together has really provided this opportunity to uniquely combine themes of portraits and crime. Uh, as portraiture in any form is explicitly visual, we felt it was important to create a small gallery of images to help formulate ideas and questions. And these, we did share these on our um, on both websites. So the gallery includes the most publicly recognizable portraits of crime, which obviously the mugshot, which is uh, late 19th century or earlier 20th century photographs. Importantly, digitization has meant that many are now in the public domain and can be found, for example, on ancestry. Um, and accessible accessibility to these portraits means they are also been commercially um, commercialized or exploited. And for instance, on the gallery, we have the serial killer mag ma makeup bag or 19 crimes wine. Mugshots have similarly been used for artistic reinterpretation. And here we have included um, Myra by Marcus Harvey. Well, we've also included the portrait of Peter Tatchell, which has redeployed the mugshot in order to provide himself with a voice. And this is, of course, something the original subjects of mugshots did and do not have. Uh, a further group of portraits could be seen as depicting the heroic criminal. And I've put heroic in inverted commas. We've, we've put in a print of John Shepard in his cell, Miranda Richardson in her role as Ruth Ellis in the film Dance with the Stranger. And leading on from this, portraits have been used by criminals such as Ronnie Cray um, in his photograph of drinking with Baron Boothby, for example. Um, and it, this, is, this is so that he can uh, attempt to endorse status or influence. And finally, given the non-consensual nature of a number of these images, we felt it was important to include self-portraits by individuals who are going through or have been through the criminal justice system in order that they can portray themselves as perhaps as a corrective to the often highly stereotypical image of a, of a typical criminal. And again, I put that in inverted commas. So these images raise questions around the definition of a portrait of crime and actually of a portrait. For example, does a portrait have to be a consensual act? The fact that a question mark has been inserted in our event title leaves this open. Were the subjects of mugshots eventually found guilty? Was their crime criminal by today's standards? So it's an intriguing and it's a complex subject and, and it'll be explored today in more detail during the course of this morning by our panelists. Please do, I will put up the link to the, the gallery so you can have a look in the conversation. Sorry, I couldn't share that. I'm not sure what happened. Um, anyway, so at this point, I'll hand over to Heather, who's going to be our co-chair today. Thank you. Okay, thanks, Angie. Just a couple of things. Um, in addition to the thanks that Angie made, I'd just like to thank uh, the Arts Fund, who specifically um, supported this event um, um the arts council have supported the special subject groups so thanks to them and i'd like to introduce our first speaker um, and i'm really pleased to welcome kareen brazier and kareen is a heritage manager at the west midlands police museum and she's going to be talking to the title in focus west midlands police mugshot collection thank you kareen Hi, good morning everyone. Um, thank you very much for having me. I'm really pleased to be able to share what we've done at West Midlands with you all. Okay, so um, I've volunteered and worked with the West Midlands Police Museum for quite some years. Um, I've been, I've worked with West Midlands Police in, in different roles since 2005. I've volunteered with the museum since 2014 and I've been working in the museum full-time since 2017 on, on different things, uh, including digitising the collection, 
and uh, working on a heritage lottery bid to relocate the museum from a small police station in the suburbs of Birmingham into a prime city centre Victorian lockup, uh, which we're hoping to reopen early next year. Um, but this is one of my favourite parts of the collection, so I'm, I'm really pleased to be able to share more information about it with you all. So uh, this is what I want to run through today then. So to tell you a bit about the fascinating collection that we've got, show you, of course, some of the amazing images um, and talk through some of the differences in, in that collection. Tell you a little bit about our digitisation journey and then finally finish with some of the, <clears throat> the current uses of that collection. So we'll start then with some of my, my all time favourite images from the collection, the collodion positives. So this takes us all the way back to 1853 and the top, uh, the image that is uh, second from the left on the top row is a gentleman called Isaac Ellery. And that is the oldest image in our collection. That image dates back to 1853. And it's just incredible seeing how clear that image is and how, how much detail is captured within it, particularly when you compare it with some of the, the recent, um, the, the first digital cameras and how pixelated they were and how terrible it was. The quality of these images are absolutely incredible. Um, and Birmingham City Police was the very first police force in the UK, I believe, to start taking prisoner mugshots. I think there were a couple of prisons that started around the same time, but to my knowledge, we're the first police force, and I believe pipped in the in the rest of the world by Belgium, who, who might have been the very first, or one of the very first countries to start doing it. So this is where photography was really in its infancy. It's a brand new technology, um, and it's really quite pioneering the fact that a police force thought so early on that there would be benefits from taking photographs and using them to identify offenders, to, to retain it as part of the record about that individual so that if they come to notice again, then they could be used to um, identify that person, to confirm an identity, and also to have within um, their, their criminal investigation offices some record of some of the persistent offenders so that when officers were trying to identify people or perhaps identify people that they'd seen, they could look at some of those mugshots uh, and do just that. So these images are, are absolutely beautiful. They're, they're kept within these wonderful little frames. Um, they're very similar to daguerreotype images, which is the first commercially available type of photography, but they're a little bit different. Um, they're, they're also known as ambrotypes um, and they date back to the 1850s and 60s. And, and these images um, cover those two decades. So the, we don't know exactly what constituted a requirement for a photograph to be taken. It wouldn't appear that every single conviction at that time led to a photograph. What we do know about them is that they were taken at a photography studio on Moore Street, which was just around the corner from the Moore Street public office which was the biggest cell block in Birmingham city centre at that time. And um, so these individuals would have been held in that cell block. They would have gone to court at the Moore Street public office. And at some point they were marched down the street, down Moore Street into this newly opened photography studio, probably pushed past paying customers who might have been spending their, their life savings on the only family portrait they were ever going to have. And then they were, they were produced for this um, photograph to be taken. It's really interesting to see what some of them are wearing. You can see the top hat on the gentleman in the bottom row. Um, it's like they're wearing their Sunday best, like they've, they've uh, had to, to dress up specially for the occasion. They're posed. Sometimes the only real difference between these images and family portraits at the time, occasionally you can see the little glint of a silver bracelet in the corner of the image, but absolutely remarkable images. Um, and the saddest thing really about them for me is that some of them, we don't have the information anymore about their names or their offences, and it will be impossible for us ever to identify who they are. So that's quite sad, but we're lucky that for about half the images, we do know the names, we know the offences, and we can then research those people. We can see what happened to them later on. We can see if they came to notice again, if they emigrated, um, all sorts of things like that from the information that's out there. So these are the very earliest mug shots that we hold in the collection. And then by the 1870s, with the 1871 Prevention of Crime Act, forces all around the country start to take mug shots of their local offenders. It becomes mandatory and all forces need to start thinking about how they're going to do it, how they're going to capture them, how they're going to record them and share them and utilise them going forwards. So this is the start of our criminal ledgers and this is the start of the records being laid out like this. And they remain like this probably for about 50 years. They're very, very similar to the, the mugshots that, that feature for the next 50 odd years. 
and it captures basic information about the individual and their age at the time, the date of the offence. You can see the uh, in the chalkboards they're holding the year at the end of the number is the year that they were they were taken. It gives you the offence that they were charged with or the offence they were arrested with, because sometimes we do have um, records on here that were found not guilty or withdrawn from court. And it will give you the the outcome, the disposal, if there is one. And it will also give some basic descriptive information on the bottom row. So say, take the bottom left record, for example, age 16, five foot one and brown brown hair or brown eyes and you can see the information above that he was sentenced to 21 days imprisonment for stealing four cigars from a shop and the vast majority of offences in these collections are theft offences it's a fascinating insight into Victorian society it, it gives us so much information about not only these individuals but about what crimes were prolific at the time what the sentencing regimes might have been like how harsh or, or lenient the judges might have been uh, I, certainly for me, I think that they were very, very harsh back then. There's quite a lot of young teenage boys, possibly their first offences, minor theft offences, stealing handkerchiefs, food, books, all sorts of things like that, probably through desperation. And they're sentenced to the birching rod or imprisonment or hard labour. It, it really is a very harrowing glance at Victorian society. One thing I do find quite interesting about the 1870s images is um, the coats that they're wearing. They all seem to be wearing the same coat. And it just makes me wonder if there was a dressing up box for photography or if maybe these pictures were taken after they'd been to prison and they'd come back again for some reason. So they were, maybe they were issued with clothing because their own clothing was insufficient. Um, that's not something I think I'll ever manage to answer, but it's just a question that I have in my mind. And then as we progress through, through the images, now in the 1880s, sometimes you can see other examples of how the photography methods have changed. This individual is holding up their hands, and, and this was a common practice at, at some point for individuals to hold their hands up like this to show if any fingers were missing or parts of their fingers were missing or if they had any, anything uh, malformed on their hands, for example. So it's just about capturing more information within that one image. And there are other pictures that we have where you can see a mirror next to the head of the individual. So it gives you the side profile within the same image rather than ha having to take two images and the cost of producing those images. So that was another technique that was used around about this time. Uh, and the, the ledgers are very similar to the 1870s. The format is similar. The, the, the technique is, is very similar and just continues throughout the 1880s and into the 1890s. Now, uh, any of you who may have been to our Victorian lockup that, that we're moving the museum to might recognize in the background there that that window is within the lockup itself. It helps us to place this picture within the lockup. So from 1891, when the lockup opened, this makes some of these pictures much more exciting for me because it means they are the oldest photographs that we hold from inside the lockup. It is literally the only window that's in there on the first floor and with the glass roof, the lighting conditions were perfect for photography. So we can show what, exactly where these pictures were taken and there will be some displays on photography in our new museum showing pictures like this. So that's more than just a mugshot, but this is the picture that was in the ledger for this particular individual. And I think some of these pictures were taken because the individual would refuse to have their photograph taken. And we found evidence that sometimes a hidden camera would be used to take a picture of them whilst their basic information was being recorded. So maybe they thought they'd got away with not posing for a photograph, but actually the officers had still managed to capture one and they still stuck it in the ledger. Then on to the 1900s, and uh, I don't know if any of you have heard about that little known gang, the Peaky Blinders. This is a set of images that is often rolled out whenever the Peaky Blinders are talked about. These individuals are often cited as the real Peaky Blinders, but were they really Peaky Blinders? Um, that's obviously not, not the topic of this, uh, this, this presentation, um, but it, it, it's, it's very iconic. It's, it is a prime example of of police mugshots being utilised uh, and, and they come out time and time again whenever the Peaky Blinders are talked about in the media. So this image in particular is out there, it's scattered all over the web for all sorts of different things. People have commercialised this image and they've turned it into mugs and all sorts of different things. 
And most of these individuals were just common criminals. They weren't really Peaky Blinders. They were just thieves and thugs and villains. But that particular set of mugshots has just been, it's captured the imagination of people for some reason and has, has become um, iconized as, as the, uh, the real Peaky Blinders. So you can see, uh, this is a great example of being able to see the fashions changing over time. So for example, the headgear of the individuals, they're moving to flat caps and then they move to bowler hats. And then eventually, obviously nowadays, most people don't have a hat on. So the, the mugshot collection doesn't just show us about the crimes and the sentences and things like that. It gives us a fantastic catalog of how fashions are changing. And, and it is, it's a snapshot of the general public really at the time, isn't it? So you can see their fashions, you can see what headgear they're wearing, you can see the hairstyles of the ladies, um, all sorts of different things like that. So for social historians, it really is a rich archive as well. And then um, some of the, most of the, 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 the ladies mugshots that we have come a little bit later on. So from the 1910s to the 1930s, we've got a really big ledger that covers most of the, the female images that we have. Um, I didn't manage to find any of the images with the fantastic headgear with the feathers and all sorts of uh, crazy things going on with the hair for this presentation. But I think this shows you a little bit of variety in terms of hairstyles and headgear. And of course, now they're, they're starting to take images, two images, one from the front and one from the side. So you can see the individual with the hat on, without the hat on. And of course, that's another useful investigative tool for the officer. It's important for them to see what the individual looks like from the side and to see what they look like with their hat on, because that's how they might look when they're out on the street. And it's important for the officer to be able to see that as well as the, the posed frontal image that you'd get from a, a standard mugshot. So what have we done recently then around digitization? We, we've got seven of these ledgers. There's probably 250 pages in each one. There's around about four or five images on each page um, with obviously some exceptions where the images have been lost or, or cut out for whatever reason. So altogether, there's probably in the region of eight or nine thousand images out there. Some of them are not very good quality. Some of them have faded over time. I can only assume that in, in many years past, some of these mugshots have been out on display and maybe got light damaged. That could be well before they made it into the museum. It could be when they were back in the original offices. Um, so all sorts of things have happened for, to them and, and they're in different stages of, um, of, of disrepair. Some of them are in fantastic condition still uh, and we're very, very fortunate for that. Some of them are, are really starting to fall to pieces and we're having to look at what conservation work we can do to them to prevent them from deteriorating any further um, and try to stabilize them and, and make sure that we can continue to use them going forwards. So it was really important for me that we try and digitize those records so that we could dramatically reduce the amount of times they were handled. Hopefully, I mean, they wouldn't have to be handled anymore. So we're not gonna impact on their condition ourselves. And many efforts have been made within the museum team, uh, particularly by our late curator, Dave Cross, who had spent an awful long time trying to photograph and catalog these images. And, and with so many thousand images, you can imagine how many hours he might have spent doing that. So there were various photographs in existence. There were photocopies, there were discs, there were various spreadsheets and all sorts of things in existence when I turned up. So I got Ancestry involved and I invited them to come in and have a look. And we had some discussions around what could they do? Could they come and scan all of these photos as well as a number of our police records? What, what would they do with them? What could we get in return? You know, we didn't just want everything to be photographed and scanned and taken away and then we don't get any benefit out of it. So we came to an agreement with Ancestry that everything that they scanned, we would get the scanned images as well. And we would be able to use them as if they were our own images. So, for example, we can use them in our publications. We can use them in social media and for marketing. So it was like we had scanned them ourselves. But of course, they're getting out on Ancestry at the same time. And we made all of the photos, all of the uh, mug shots made it onto Ancestry, but only a small percentage of the police records that got scanned made it onto Ancestry. So it, it, for me, it was a really, really good deal on our part. And it meant that we would get that significant resource of very high quality images. They were scanned to, I think, over 300 DPI, which was better than what we'd been able to do with our own scanners. So it meant we had amazing images. We had a very comprehensive 
catalogue and indexes that came back from Ancestry. Uh, and, and really importantly, we were able to utilise them as we would have done if they were our own images. So you can see the entirety of the West Midlands Police mugshot collection on Ancestry now. Um, and then what, what else are we doing with those images? So I've mentioned about the museum reopening in April and we've been busy writing new displays and looking at different themed areas and all sorts of things to, to put out, um, ideally things that have not been put out before. So, so lots of brand new content. And they, they do include a Peaky Blinders display. They include two different photography displays, one from the perspective of the, the force photographer going out and photographing crime scenes and, and that sort of side of photography. And then another side that looks at the mug shots and talks through a lot of what I've talked through here, the different examples of photography and how things changed over the years, the different techniques that would be used and showcasing some of these really iconic images and, um, and some of the stories behind them. So the, a lot of them are going to feature in those new displays. We do get various academics write to us asking us for different images. You'd be surprised, maybe you wouldn't be surprised, almost every single academic request that we get asks to see records for Peaky Blinders. Um, disappointingly, our records are not categorised into Peaky Blinders and non-Peaky Blinders. So it, th there isn't really anything about Peaky Blinders other than if you go and do some other research and you come up with particular names, you can always ask us to look for those names and, and we will see what we have. Um, but we, we often can't satisfy people looking for images of Peaky Blinders, but we can look for images to do with other topics, maybe different offences, um, maybe different genres or time periods or um, different genders, that sort of thing. Uh, and then we do do lots of stuff on social media and our website and books. Uh, we know there's a there's a story behind every single one of these photographs. And thanks to the British Newspaper Archive, we can find an awful lot of information about who they were, the crimes they did, the sentences that they um, they received, um, all sorts of fantastic information like that. And I would say that that website contains far more information than we have in our museum about crimes and investigation. We, we just didn't seem to retain those sorts of files, unfortunately. So loads and loads of information out there, always looking to do more research and understand the people behind the mugshots. And we share some of these images because they're really thought provoking, they're really engaging. And um, even just this simple one that we put out yesterday, Mugshot Monday is just a catchy um, term that we've come up with to, to put things out on social media. And we don't, we don't poke fun at the individuals. We don't, um, you know, we, we, we try to we, we try to treat them with respect. You know, they, they, they all have a story, they all have a background to them. Um, and although our mugshot collection goes all the way up to the, the 1960s, we would never use photographs in our museum for, for these sorts of purposes that were less than 100 years old. We, we would always only use images of individuals once they've been deemed to reach 100 years of age. So there's, there's no concerns around um, using images for people who are still living or images um, to do with crimes that perhaps are still very much in the public memory. So picking images from the 1800s is normally the safest thing to do. But we, we put them out there. We want people to talk about them. We want people to see them and be interested and come and find out more information from us about the history of policing the West Midlands. So, um, so, so that's, that's a number of different things that we do for that. And I think... That is my last slide. So if you're if you've enjoyed seeing all those images, um, there's lots more. We put lots of stuff out. We're on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. Please check us out. Thank you, Corinne. That was uh, really interesting, and um, it's 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 great that sort of question you raised there about the um, almost mythologizing mythologi can't pronounce it mythologizing of Peaky Blinders. Yeah. You know? Um, and of course, the fact that the pictures that you have are from the late 19th, early 20th century, as opposed to the uh, the, the series that situates them in the interwar period. But exactly. I won't get on my Peaky Blinders hobby horse because it yeah. was just really boring <laughs> and really ranting. But anyway, thank you. So I'm going to turn to our uh, swiftly to our next presentation. And I'm really uh, pleased to welcome Fiona Cohen. Um, who is the Director of Arts for Kirstner Arts. And she's going to talk to a presentation called Portraiture as Practiced by Those in Secure Settings, the Kirstner Arts Experience. And she will also show a short filmed interview with Sarah, a Kirstner artist. Okay, so uh, Fiona, 
can I hand over to you? Okay, so um, I'm Fiona. I'm the Director of Arts at Carcela Arts. Um, we are a criminal justice charity that works in the arts. So um, for those of you who might have not heard of Carcela, we're quite a small charity. We work across the whole of the UK. Um, we're based um, just outside Wormwood Scrubs in London. And we encourage people in the criminal justice system, most of whom are in prison, uh, to participate in the arts. Um, we've got a huge history of this engagement in the arts and prisons and criminal justice settings. Um, and Carcela is one of the oldest charities in the sector. So we've been going for 60 years as of 2022. Um, so I've hopefully given you a quick overview of what we do. We do, it's very multi-layered. We do exhibitions um, so that entrants can communicate with the public. We encourage um, people through the awards that we give, um, mentoring projects. Um, we have displays of work around the country in kind of quite accessible spaces, even prison visit, visitor centres. Um, and we have an annual exhibition every year at the South Bank Centre in London. And we also have regional and national exhibitions around the, around the UK. So we recently had a show in Manchester for work from the Northwest um, and a show in Sheffield from work from Yorkshire. So I'm going to give a very brief overview, quickly um, talking just very briefly about our entries in general. Um, our portraits, and then um, I've got quite a few slides of self-portraits, um, and then a little interview that I did last week with one of our brilliant entrants who's been through our mentoring programme, um, and then just a few more thoughts. So um, the first slide that I've got here, hopefully, <laughs> I just wanted to make the point that actually most of our entries in some way um, our self-portrait. So whether it's a portrait of the dog from home that you miss, uh, there's perhaps no um, actual image of a human in your image, yet you've got a prison cell that shows your state or well, your situation, your current situation and your state of mind. Um, and perhaps you've dug inside and come up with a poem or a piece of music, um, which we also take. So we get about 7,000 entries every year from people all over the UK. Um, and about 45% of those are visual arts entries, but there's many, many um, very revealing um, pieces of poetry that we get as well, for example. So um, before I go into self-portraits, I had to have a nod to our portraits of celebrities. Um, we have a, a whole category of Carcela Awards, which is just for portraiture. And in that category, there's celebrities, key people around the prison, uh, cellmates. Um, there's um, and a lot of portraits of families. And I think that um, the portraiture category in general can really give people a really strong sense of achievement. Um, people can really feel progress quite, um, maybe in a way, if they work very, very diligently, very hard at a piece, they can really get a sense of achievement um, by the end of working on it and sharing it with others. Um, and it's really interesting to see who people choose to do portraits of. And I think that, again, when I said that um, there's an element of self-portraiture in everything that's entered into Carcela, um, the portraits of celebrities tell quite a lot about the entrance as well. We see so many uh, changes in who people select to, 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 do, to make portraits of every year. Um, and there's definitely trends um, and it's, wonderful to see how people select people who are kind of in the outside world and it's obviously connecting often with current affairs so we've had a lot of Boris Johnson's this year a lot of Marcus Rashford um, we get 
things, pieces that could be seen as critiques of celebrities and pieces that are more about admiration. So this person who um, did this amazing portrait of Nelson Mandela, which was exhibited at our South Bank exhibition, um, just has a quote here, which you can read yourselves, which is um, just about how making this portrait of Nelson Mandela from selecting who the portrait was going to be of and then working through it and then seeing the outcome and sharing it with others, um, how that whole experience has taken the person on a journey. Um, and I think that's, that's a really kind of common expression that our, our entrance tells about arts in general, but definitely portraiture. So moving on to just our self-portraits, and I know the first one is a judge, which is probably not a self-portrait, but um, I had to put it in because it's um, the, the self-portraits entered into Karsler, I can see as having uh, maybe three themes within them. So people who are looking back, they're looking at how they got into the current situation that they're in. So most of our entrants, when they make their work, are inside a prison, not all, but most. Um, and so portraits and self-portraits that look back are often of memory of the courtroom um, or memory of perhaps kind of negative experiences that perhaps contributed to ending up in prison, to their sentencing, um, and also looking back at family um, obviously the memories of family can be really positive, but sometimes you do feel that the image is, is about someone missing family um, and thinking through maybe the impact of imprisonment on their family. So there's a lot of our entrants who are really looking back and I think these three images hopefully capture that to some extent. And I love the judge and the way that he's <laughs> the person's memory of the judge is very much like this huge image that rolls up and is very strange, strangely lit with bright colours. So the other aspect of self-portraiture um, that you can, as an audience, as a viewer, you can really see what someone's doing um, is coming to terms with where they currently are and their current situation. Um, and I suppose the three images that I've picked here are relatively typical in that, you know, they are quite despairing, these images. Um, but these are people considering how they are currently feeling. And, you know, maybe they are, they are probably at rock bottom and they are showing that. Um, and I think, I hope that that comes across to other people as something that's really honest, really difficult to do to really look deeply at yourself and at the situation that you're in. And I think that what always humbles me um, quite a lot um, when I visit prisons is that um, most prisons are male prisons and it's an extremely masculine environment. And it's not necessarily where you would stereotypically think that um, people were going to be able to be this open and this honest about their emotions and their current situation um, and bearing in mind there's not much privacy so these works will be made and people will be looking at them around the prison other prisoners will look at these um, and like all carceral entries you know there's a deliberate choice to then even go one step further which is to share them with carceral arts and the awards judges and the outside world. So I love these three PCs from 2020, um, especially love the photograph piece. Um, and the person with the photograph piece is also cleverly dealing with, with, a, with thinking through, well, I don't want to be identified by this photograph. So at the same, at the same time as making a great image, they are also dealing with a kind of um, little artistic challenge of how to keep anonymity in this picture. And so these self-portraits are all looking at, I think, looking into the future a bit more. 
um, generally speaking, they're a bit more hopeful and kind of imagining a new future for, for the person who's making them. And I think that's another, it's just such a key important part of the self-portrait um, and kind of coming out and emerging from prison, from the prison experience. Um, and I love the, um, I really love the one that's kind of a selfie, um, which it was entered into our together category. So every year, Carissa Arts has one themed category that people can enter their work into. Um, and so the 2021 theme is the word together. Um, and we have a lot of brilliant images around that, um, around that theme from this year. So in, at, at Carisla, it's really we're obviously uniquely placed. Our entrants, people who participate in our programmes, are working with us um, currently. So we're uniquely placed to get the entrants' own words um, that they can tell us so much about their intention, about what they're getting from making artwork, from self-portraiture, and what they want to share. So I've got some quotes for the next couple of slides. So that rather than me paraphrasing, I can kind of give you give you what our entrants say in their own words. So these people are all commenting on self-portraiture. Most of them were exhibited in an exhibition recently. So someone is commenting on further education, how um, taking part in the arts in general has opened up um, that knowledge that you could participate in education. So the arts are often a first step in within prisons. Um, this person cites mentoring. So Carcel offers mentoring, but also lots of other charities um, and organizations working in criminal justice do. Um, and for some people, participating in a program like the arts um, is a first step into having the confidence to get involved in mentoring um, and helping others, which I think is about seeing yourself differently as well. Um, so many entrants who get involved with the arts in prison, it's, it's a little bit like being part of a community. So you're also able to, um, within the classroom, or you might encourage other people around you. You might see someone who's struggling with confidence or struggling with inspiration, and you might help spark that. And I think our entrants definitely realise that that's a process that's going on for them. Um, there was a quote about one of our self-portraits in the South Bank exhibition this year. What inspired this piece was how I see myself in the mirror. And I mean, obviously that could be on a surface level, but I think he's also someone looking really deeply at themselves and at their current situation. Um, and this next quote at the bottom, the person is talking about how taking part in the arts um, a team part in portraiture is giving them an outlet, is getting them out of the here and now, and they're experiencing a sense of freedom. Um, someone else who um, had a self-portrait in our South Bank exhibition said that creating the piece had given them an insight into themselves, which I thought was really quite a beautiful way to express it. Someone else said it was a confidence boost, um, and that the praise that they re received, especially on getting selected for an exhibition, was a massive um, confidence boost, self-esteem boost. And the final person at the bottom um, is making the link for, for us, really, that, you know, definitely taking part in the arts is, is, a, is part of the puzzle, along with many other, many other things that can hopefully be a step towards um, people managing to be rehabilitated and to break the cycle of offending. It's, it's a, a, an element of all the things that, um, that go to do with that. And I love that the Centrum is, is actually seeing that himself and he's commenting on it and he's telling us about it. In a moment, we have a little film, which is an interview that I did last week with Sarah. Sarah has been an entrant to Carcelar for a few years. Hi, Fiona. Um, Sorry to interrupt. We are actually mm -hmm. um, losing time a bit. So, okay. Uh, yep. Yeah, okay. 
I'll, I'll introduce it quicker. <laughs> Sarah has been an entrant to CARSA for a few years um, and she's currently on our mentoring programme. Um, I'll ask her a few questions about what that's meant to her. Um, and I hope that you can see quite a journey that she's been through. So I think Michael is going to play the video now. So Sarah, you joined our mentoring programme um, after coming through the criminal justice system, being on probation. You applied for our mentoring programme. Am I right in thinking about two years ago now? Uh, yeah, it was about two years ago. Um, uh, I think um, it was really bizarre. I, uh, I had no idea um, that the COSLER or the mentoring programme or any of this even existed it was completely out of the blue and um, my probation officer at the time just casually mentioned oh yeah there's this thing called the COSLA uh, you know uh, they run a mentoring program um, I can sort of put you on it and I was like oh yeah she, obviously I enjoyed the arts anyway and she just thought it'd be a really good thing um, and then obviously I was accepted onto the mentoring program um, and well uh, everything absolutely 1000% changed. Um, I was, um, yeah, just swept up into this, this really mad world of um, art. And I'd never really been involved so deeply um, in the arts um, as I have when um, I first became involved um, with the mentoring programme and with the COSLA. Oh, wow. So your probation officer, he or she, did they why did they think that you would be interested in the mentoring program did they see you getting some benefits out of the arts or did you did you talk about some experiences you were having using drawing and painting they had um a women's group that they ran um weekly and um i went to that and they had sort of like an art group there um and i was doing art at home as well um in between um, and they all knew that I had a strong interest in the arts um, and uh, um, I think they all just thought it'd be beneficial because I didn't really know what I wanted to do or where I wanted to go. Um, and I had some really good skills um, and it was it was more frustrating not having anywhere to put it, if that makes sense. Just, you know, mm -hmm. drawing and I started drawing when I my mum would say as soon as I could hold a pencil that's when it began for me um so yeah I was drawing from a very young age I used to draw things I used to like copying things so my friends would get me to draw them little pictures during lunch times and breaks and stuff um, and I'd help out at drama as well with the scenery and production um I took art for a GCSE um and then as I came through my teens um I got involved um in some some stuff and um yeah sort of navigated away from the arts and then I throughout points in my life I've sort of steered towards it bounced into it and then bounced back away from it um and I would say the last two years is the only the this time um I've used constructively and you know really want to make a career out of art now um, I've never really taken myself seriously as an artist, you know, but now when I say, oh, you know, what do you do? Oh, I'm an artist. And it's mm -hmm. I'm quite proud to say that I'm an artist because mm -hmm. I used to think to myself as a child, you know, I've got it's something that you can't do. You know, it's something you can't ever do and be successful in or make a career in or, you know, it's not about that. It's about just creating and having that outlet and being able to you know share with your audience or even with yourself it just gives you something to be excited about obviously when you're doing a portrait of someone else you're, you're attached but disattached at the same time so you're doing the portrait of the person and and that's the person and you're trying to convey as much of that person in that portrait as you possibly can trying to capture yourself and convey that in a portrait was very interesting so trying to replicate time and rebirth and because almost the self-portrait that I did um, and have done quite recently was um, for the Ruth Bochard collection. Um, and I wanted to do one 
where I was in my most natural state. Um, so I'm very at one with the elements. So we like to go for nature walks quite often. Uh, we've got two mad dogs. So I'm out in nature quite a lot. Um, I like to meditate as well. So have this whole uh, mother earth sort of vibes going on. Um, and it was just really different in the sense that when you know you're looking at yourself you have to portray all of the faults and all of the flaws all the things that you don't like about your body um you know some things that you think are beautiful beautiful about yourself you know other things that you don't particularly like about yourself you still have to get them as yeah as as correct as you possibly can and, and it was really hard to it was sort of like acceptance so you have to accept all of those faults and all of those flaws um, but in the end it was still something really beautiful i'm getting such a sense from you about how uh, rela relaxing and how positive for your well-being painting and drawing is um and you get that when you do a self-portrait and you're really meditating and kind of looking at yourself really deeply um and other people as well do you do you also find some artists do, some artists don't. Do you also find it, um, you know, like kind of challenging and actually really quite hard, you know, that you have to, you have to kind of force yourself to go back to something and discipline yourself to go back to something when you want to give up or you don't like something and you have to look, work through it. So do you, do you find it purely pleasurable being creative or do you, do you see another side to it too where it's like a tougher side? Uh, no, I definitely relate to the tougher side um, as well. And as all things, you know, there are a thousand different daily external problems that could stop me from creating, but it always boils down to me. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, and yeah, you know, there are those unproductive days and there are days when you know, this this three square centimetre, you know, hyper realistic piece of work seems like endless. And I think, my God, if I see it one more time, I might actually scream. Um, those periods of time, um, yeah, they do come. Um, but I try to give myself lots of space. I walk away um, again, meditation, um, because, again, even those parts of the art process are still a journey um you know not to be too hard on yourself you know to really relax and not put too much pressure on the situation you know when i'm feeling unmotivated to do something or maybe go with that unmotivated day i might go and stand and look at my piece with a cup of tea you know because that will usually motivate me to get on it because i'll stand there looking at it thinking oh that needs to be changed and oh, i could do with moving this around or that could be this could be here so that motivates me into getting back into it but as always it's it's difficult and it is very challenging um especially the kind of work that i want to produce it takes a lot of time and dedication how, how is the mentoring helped motivate you um so the mentor basically gave me direction because i went to my mentor with not any knowledge of of how to get my work out of the house basically where who do i go to where do i put it so she um said that i should um enter um the kozler awards and that year it was being held in the south bank center so i did um not thinking anything would come of it and um i was chosen um and that gave me the confidence then to think oh i okay you know wow this is this is good yeah this is great and um that sort of snowballed and then I'd go for my uh monthly meet and I'd discuss uh with the mentor you know what up and coming exhibitions were coming and she would discuss with me you know which ones she thought I'd be really good in um and sometimes I was like oh you know really and um I'm really glad I did and it was again it was all about the confidence I just didn't have that confidence in myself and the mentor really saw something in me that I didn't see yet it's really hard to describe but it's almost like finding art again has helped me find myself I was looking for this part of me that was missing for the longest time and I was seeking it out in other people other places you know behavior um that's not socially accepted 
and it was like there was this piece of me that was missing and if the probation officer hadn't have recognized that and you know said get onto the COSLA there's a good chance that I would still be in that cycle of the probation system um, because for the longest time I was looking for something that was in me the whole time um, and that took me a long time to figure out and art has really helped me discover that in myself and work through you know those deeper layers of ourselves you know whether it be from childhood or wherever um, and really accept and come to terms with you know things that I couldn't change in the past um, and help me move on and discover, discover you know new and exciting levels of myself that even I didn't know existed um, so that has been an absolute whirlwind of emotion and I'm just so grateful um, you know for the opportunity that I have that I've had because without it I wouldn't be here so yeah again back in the early days very uh, predominantly worked in graphite and didn't really use a lot of color um, which kind of tells you what kind of transition I've been on from a very black and white world to this very colorful wow you know this whole new reality where there's this it's basically gone from black and white Fiona to absolute technicolor <laughs> it has given me such a a new positive outlook on myself and and life and you know how it can actually be good and and it's sort of brought me to the present instead of this you know thinking about the past and worrying about the future and oh god you know this sort of limbo that you can feel yourself in sometimes when I do feel like that you know art brings me right back to the here and now what's happening how are you feeling it brings all of those emotions, you know, to the forefront so I can deal with them, process them, and then I'm feeling energized and ready to, you know, battle another cycle of, you know, whatever you know, this mad journey called life, you know, we're going through. My children now, I mean, I've gone from, in their eyes, from ex-con to someone that they're inspired by. And that yeah. is like, wow, you know, we're going on Saturday to go and see two of my works in two different galleries in London. I mean, how surreal is that going to be hopping across the road? <laughs> so surreal. But yeah, it's, it's, it's going to be real. So yeah, it's going to be very bizarre, I'm sure. <laughs> Um, so I'm just going to finish up there um, because Sarah said it better than I could. Um, and I think the thing that she said that I wanted to emphasise was that Sarah said that she, through portraiture and her journey that she's been on the last couple of years, she has changed a label, I suppose, um, how she saw herself or how she thinks her family saw her um, to someone that her children are inspired by. Um, so she's done that through taking her work, taking ownership of how she represents others. Um, she also creates a lot of self-portraits, which to keep her anonymous are not in the slideshow. So she takes control of how she is seen and how she's depicted um, through portraiture and self-portraiture. And um, I think that's one of the things that Carstler enables people to do. Thank you um, very much, Fiona and for the really um, articulate presentation talk with uh, Sarah as well. Um, so I'm really pleased to introduce our next speaker and we'll have a film from Jackie, although she is here as well. And this is Jackie Kelly, who is a freelance curator and writer. And she's going to talk to the title Peopling of the Crime Museum Uncovered, the role of portraits in personalizing an exhibition narrative. Uh, so, okay, Jackie, are you ready? I'd like to start by thanking the staff and volunteers of the Crime Museum, part of the Metropolitan Police Heritage Service, and also the Museum of London, for allowing me to use images from their collections in my presentation today. Portraits in any medium have the ability to engage the viewer and develop and enrich an exhibition's narrative. Today I would like to talk to you about the Crime Museum Uncovered exhibition, which I co-curated with Julia Hofbrand at the Museum of London in 2015. 
I want to look at how portraits were used in the exhibition to personalize the content and we'll consider the issues that faced us, the ethical decision making, the collections we were dealing with, and some examples of how we used portraits in the finished exhibition. The challenges for the curatorial team were how to humanize the exhibition and bring the people concerned to the fore. Portraits of those involved in the crimes, the victims, criminals, investigators and witnesses became a key part of the content and design of the exhibition. Some of those portraits came from the collections of the Crime Museum, others were sourced externally as supporting images. The use of portraits and their role in the exhibition became a key factor in our discussions about the ethics of display. The exhibition came about as the result of a partnership between the Museum of London, the Metropolitan Police and the Mayor's Office for Policing and Crime. The Museum of London curated the exhibition, creating the narrative, selecting the content and writing the text from the collections held by the Metropolitan Police in their Crime Museum, previously known as the Black Museum. The Crime Museum is a private museum, not open to the public, and this was the first time that many of these objects would be put on public display. As the curators, Julia and I worked closely with the curator of the Crime Museum, Paul Bickley, and his team of volunteers, as well as with a larger team at the Museum of London. Of course, at the forefront of our minds was how to ensure the prominence of the victims in the narrative, and obviously questions around the ethics of displaying such a collection. The Museum of London team undertook formative evaluation and also consulted with external specialists, including the Victims Commissioner for England and Wales and the London Policing Ethics Panel. We created a decision-making matrix for any ethical issues that we came across, either concerning a particular investigation or an individual object. The final decisions were made collaboratively between the parties concerned at a meeting chaired by Professor Leif Fenner, who holds the Chair of Philosophy and Law at King's College London, and who specialises in ethics in society, and we documented our decisions. These were primarily not to include any human remains, not to include any crime scene images that included human remains, not to include cases less than 40 years old in detail, and to consult the families of those involved where possible, and this contact would be done by the police. Above all else, we wanted the victims to be remembered and their dignity to be respected, and this was our overriding guiding principle. We placed these three questions at the start of the exhibition and they were referred to again in a film that was shown at the end of the exhibition and also in the feedback questionnaire. As curators, our initial job was to create a narrative from the collection and to make the selection of objects. Most of the collection comprised items of evidence, many of them weapons. One of the biggest challenges was how to personalise what were often quite shocking objects and how to build the stories behind cases for which only perhaps a very limited number of items existed. And here are two good examples of this issue. With the case on the left, the murder of Emily Kay in 1924, the only objects associated with the investigation were these miniature pieces of furniture used in the courtroom in a model of the house she was murdered in as a scene of crime model. To the right are two crucial pieces of evidence from the murder of Nellie True in 1918. This World War I cap badge and great coat button helped to convict David Greenwood of her murder. Both of these cases had quite complicated investigations and both featured controversial decision making, which made them clear choices for inclusion in the exhibition. But how could we animate these very tiny objects and create a context within which they could be set? Clearly portraits, images of those involved in the cases, would be an essential feature of the exhibition in order to engage our visitors in the cases we were laying before them and to create an emotional resonance, creating a more personal connection. And here we can see the difference a portrait can make to a narrative. Here are two investigations into the murders of women by their partners. Both of these cases were included in the exhibition. On the left is a drawing of Maud Marsh, who was the last victim of George Chapman, also known as Severin Klosowski. The drawing is by William Hartley, who was a prolific courtroom artist of the late 19th to early 20th century, and the image of Maud must have been made from a photograph. 
With this case, we only have the courtroom drawings, but this image of Maud is a powerful reminder of her existence as a person, and even allows us to guess something about her personality. On the right is a knife that was used to murder Emily Barrow in 1902. With this case, we just had this weapon and no images of the victim or any of those involved. And while the knife is an extremely powerful and emotive object, it tells us little of the victim herself. Now I want to move on to what assets in terms of portraits were available to us within the Crime Museum collections. With later cases, we knew we would be able to use press photographs and other images. But for the earlier cases, those dating to the late 19th and early 20th century, what images existed? As would be expected in such a collection, there are death masks and criminal record cards, and we in included selections of both of these. There were also objects that included portraits, such as the police circulars. With all of these, we chose examples that were over 100 years old for ethical reasons. And then there were a small number of investigations that held a large amount of original paper items, including portraits. This example shows the, the display for the Tichborne claimant, a very famous case of the 1870s, dealing with impersonation and proof of identity regarding an inheritance. The Crime Museum holds a large collection of material relating to this case, including cartoons, magazines and pamphlets produced by both his supporters and accusers. However, we were very aware that all of these images were largely only of criminals, and we wanted to be able to include, where possible, the faces of the victims and also the investigators, the witnesses and even the judiciary to better reflect not only the people involved, but also the demography. And here I am referring to the fact that many of the criminals featured, particularly in the death masks and record cards, were men. And this is where a very special collection of portraits helped us to create a much more nuanced and balanced display. The Crime Museum holds six volumes of the courtroom sketches of William Hartley. The sketches cover the period 1893 to 1918. And whilst mainly concerning London courtrooms, they also include a number of regional cases. They are mainly in pen and ink, although some are pencil drawings. Many are annotated with comments by Hartley himself. Some of the comments mention the names of the individuals or the nickname of the investigation, others do not. And here I would like to acknowledge the work of Keith Skinner and Alan Moss, who had done an immense amount of work on these images, identifying the investigations and the individuals concerned. And this image shows some of the sketches that we included in their exhibition frames awaiting installation in the exhibition. Hartley was an artist of considerable skill and he managed to capture much more than just a likeness of the individual. These portraits really do give an insight into the courtroom and the action therein. At a time when photography was still a rarity in the press, Hartley was capturing the context of the case as well as the criminal. On the left is a set of images from the prosecution of Harry the Valet Johnson for the theft of the Dowager Duchess of Sutherland's jewels in 1898. And you can see that Hartley has included images of the jewels and one of the detectives as well as the, accu as the accused. On the right, a series of images from the trial of Robert Wood for the murder of Emily Dimmock in what was known as the Camden Town murder trial in 1907. Show the courtroom, the lead detective, as well as the judge, the lawyers, and even a celebrity amongst the spectators. Hartley also covered the trial of Dr. Crippen for the murder of his wife, Cora, in 1910, by which time photography was being much more widely used. At this time, both photography and sketching were allowed in the courtroom, a situation that only changed following the conviction mentioned earlier of Patrick Mann for the murder of Emily Kay in 1924. A photograph was published showing Mann in the dock at the moment of his being sentenced to death, and the public outcry that followed led to legislation the following year that outlawed the taking of any images in any medium within a courtroom or court building. And this is still true today, with courtroom artists having to work from memory and notes outside of the court building. Such images as these by Hartley of the detectives and the courtroom allowed us to expand the exhibition into areas we didn't think we could, contributing, for example, to a series of mini displays within the exhibition that we called Police Procedures, which looked at different aspects of police investigations. 
the images here show a selection that showed views of the courtroom. But Hartley also managed to capture facets of an individual's personality and something of their lives. The woman on the left is Chicago May, Mary Ann Dagnan, depicted with her lover, Charles Smith, shown on trial in 1907 for the attempted murder of her previous lover, a notorious criminal, Eddie Guerin. She had an amazing life and was obviously a woman of some determination, and I think you can see that in her face. But I also love the flamboyance of the hat she has worn in court, which again I think speaks to her character. By contrast, in the centre is an image of Maud Eddington, a 22-year-old who was accused of murdering her lover, John Bellis. She was found not guilty since she admitted she was attempting suicide and Bellis had tried to stop her and been shot in the struggle. She was found guilty, however, of attempting to take her own life and sentenced to 15 months imprisonment with hard labour. The newspaper reports tell how she fainted and had to be carried from the dock. And on the right is Johann Schneider, aged 36, who was found guilty of the murder of her baker's assistant, Conrad Berndt, in 1898. He had also tried to murder the baker who had previously employed him. Schneider had been out of work for some time and was struggling to support his wife and children. And I think Hartley's portrait shows some of this despair and desperation. Schneider was hanged in 1899. Most of the portraits I have discussed so far relate to the late 19th and early 20th century. And they mostly featured in the first section of the exhibition, which was devoted to the creation and early history of the collections. The design of this area was inspired by images of the early crime museum, as you can see in this slide. But I now want to move on to the larger main gallery space, which contained material relating to investigations from 1905 to 2007. Here the design changed, and as you can see, reproduction portraits were a key feature of this change in design. The main body of the space contained thematic displays, such as terrorism, weapons and espionage, while the long back wall on the right in this slide contained a display of 24 investigations which were looked at in more detail and were arranged in chronological order from 1905 to 1975. We worked very closely with our exhibition designers, GUM Studios, and our graphic designers, Thomas Mance and Company emphasising the importance of people to the stories and our desire to feature the victims prominently. The design in this area was influenced by press coverage of crime stories and from that the designers came up with the idea of using prominently placed portraits arranged in a zigzag for the chronological cases. These images were pixelated, reminiscent of old newspaper photographs. The initial designs featured just the criminals but this gave them too much prominence and gave a very male dominated slant to the gallery. Our solution was to feature a variety of the people involved, witnesses, detectives, victims and criminals. And this meant that the display was much more balanced, male, female, and even allowed the inclusion of children. For each of the individual cases, we tried to source images of the victims, as well as contextual images where suitable. And for some of the displays, this was supplemented by AV footage, which was sourced and edited by Cosmic Carrot, as with this case of the acid bath murderer, John Haig. Where we used images of the victims in the large portraits, we tried to choose images of them looking happy or relaxed, or as they might want to have been remembered, reflecting them as the individuals they had been away from these cases in their normal life. And finally, I want to mention two cases where I felt that these reproduction supporting portraits worked very powerfully. The first concerns a victim and the second a criminal. The Crime Museum holds a large collection relating to the Great Train Robbery of 1963, with a lot of police flyers and wanted posters such as that to the left in this slide. Note incidentally how someone has carefully crossed off each of the photographs of people as they were captured. This is a case which has a light-hearted side to it. There are books, movies and documentaries about it, and the objects on display included a champagne bottle and a ketchup bottle marked for fingerprints. But we wanted to remind people that it was not a victimless crime. The inclusion of the photograph of Jack Mills, the train driver, who never fully recovered from his injuries, centrally placed within the display was a crucial part of the story. 
In the second case, I wanted to go back to one of the cases mentioned earlier in this talk, the murder of Nellie True by David Greenwood. The cat badge and button found at the murder scene led the detectives to Greenwood, who vehemently denied the crime. He was convicted and sentenced to death, but on appeal this was reduced to life imprisonment. He was released in 1933. These photographs from the case files of the National Archives show Greenwood aged 21 at the time of his arrest and again when released at the age of 36. Prior to the murder, he had served in World War I and had been buried in a trench collapse, leaving him with a weak heart and suffering from fainting fits. And it was argued at his trial that he would have been too weak to have strangled Nellie. Three years later, a patient in a mental hospital in Dorset confessed to the murder, but a decision was made not to send the case to the Court of Appeal. So, was Greenwood guilty? We will never know, but the mark of his time in prison is clearly written on his features in these two photographs. The exhibition was one of the most popular ever held at the Museum of London and was attended by over 130,000 visitors. Over 12,000 of the accompanying publications were also sold during the six month run. We received very positive feedback about the content and about the treatment of the victims within the narrative. And I would say that much of this is due to the prominent role that portraits played within the displays and the design and their unique ability to draw in the visitor and enable them to more closely identify with the story. Portraits enabled us to add an extra layer to a narrative and to pose questions, often without even having to put those questions into words. I'm going to keep the introduction short here because you can find speaker bios on the UBG CAP websites. So our first speaker of this second session is Heather Shaw. Heather's Professor of History at Manchester Metropolitan University. And the title of her talk is Picturing Infamy from Portraits to Mugshots. Heather, over to you. Brilliant. Um, and, and actually there was a question from Anonymous, which I really want us to pick up on in the Q and A at the at the at the end about the right to not be remembered, um, <laughs> which I think is really important to uh, talk about in the ethics of of mugshots and other of of criminal portraiture. So I'd like to start this presentation by focusing on an image made in 1995 by Marcus Harvey, a member of the Young British Artist Group, uh, thereafter known as the YBAs, called. Myra, the painting was exhibited in the Sensation exhibition in 1997, which was held at the Royal Academy of Art. And this very famous exhibition was notable, was notable for showing the work of many of the YBAs, including Tracy Emin and Damien Hurst. But Myra would prove the most controversial image in the exhibition. So featuring the face of the murderess, Myra Hindley, the painting was made up of handprints taken from a plaster cast of a child's hand. As the Guardian later noted, the show was picketed by the pressure group Mothers Against Murder and Aggression, and they were accompanied by Winnie Johnson, the mother of one of Hindley's victims. They asked for the work to be removed, and incidentally so did Hindley, who was still alive and obviously still in prison at this point. Windows were smashed at the Academy's home in Burlington House, Eggs and ink were thrown at the picture, which was temporarily removed, restored, placed beyond, behind pers perspex and guarded by security men. Now, Harvey's image was based on the police mugshot taken of Myra Hindley upon her arrest with her accomplice Ian Brady in 1965, and obviously there on the left of the picture. Even before Harvey's interpretation, this image had been controversial. So there was always something about the image that caught the imagination of the public and shaped understanding of both Hindley and the series of murders. The mugshot seemed to convey what the journalist Nikki Gerrard described as the face of human evil. As Paul Lashmere stated, the right image can elevate a criminal or crime victor to iconic status. Now, part of the reason for the notoriety of Hindley's mugshot was, of course, the fact that she was a woman. Female serial killers are the exception, and Hindley's mugshot 
helped to helped the public to cast her as a monster rather than as a woman. And the mugshot itself was simply a product of the arrest and documenting process at Hyde Police Station uh, in Cheshire today in Greater Manchester, a snap of the camera to re record the accused for posterity. So did the mugshot reflect Hindley's inner demons or like Harvey, did the public interpret it in light of what they knew about their crimes? So this relationship between between the criminal image and the public was one which long preceded the repulsion and fascination with Hindley's mugshot. And for the rest of this presentation, I'd like to travel back in time to the late 17th and early 18th century, when arguably the first images of criminal infamy were produced by artists, both known and unknown. I'll then say something about the emergence of the use of criminal photography in the, in the pseudoscience of the mid to late 19th century, finishing with a brief discussion of the mugshot from the later 19th century. So starting with criminal biography and imagery. So woodcuts and other drawings of individual identified criminals exist from the 17th century at least, and possibly earlier if we include political and religious criminals. However, here I focus on the more mundane of transgressors, thieves, pickpockets and robbers. And some of the early, earliest early modern images of a known criminal that survive are those of the roaring girl, Mary Frith or Moll Cutpurse. So Mary was a pickpocket and receiver of stolen goods born around 1584 and active till around 1659 when she died of dropsy. Frith, as we can see from our images, and most of these images are from the National Portrait Gallery, Frith was somebody, clearly somebody who challenged conventional stereotypes. The pictures we have show her smoking a pipe and dressing in masculine clothes. And from quite early in her career, Mary seems to have embraced a form of celebrity. And indeed, what much of what we know about her is drawn from a sensationalist biography that was written after her death. So this book published in 1662 helped to mythologize the roaring girl. And it was also through the writings of contemporary playwrights that a public image was made. So in her lifetime, at least two plays were written about her, perhaps most notably a Jacobean comedy called The Roaring Girl by Thomas Decker and Thomas Middleton, who were both very well known playwrights at the time. And that was published in 1611. And Thrift really embraced their public image by actually ascending to the theatre stage herself at the Fortune Theatre in Cripplegate. So she, to some extent, she plays with her image. And um, I guess Mary is an early example of the interesting collusion between the criminal, the artist or photographer and the public that we can sometimes see in the history of criminal portraiture. During the late 17th and 18th century, the public first for criminal stories would become even more significant with the emergence of the genre of criminal biography and in parallel the provocative images of that notable of criminals, the highway robber. So here we see a collection of portraits um, of Jerry Abershaw, who was a highway man who was executed on Ken Kennington Common in 1795. Captain James McLean or McLean hanged at Tyburn in 1750. At the top on the right hand, we see John 16 string Jack Ran, and he was named after the colored strings he wore on his breeches. And he was also executed in Tyburn in 1774. And of course, at the bottom there, Richard Dick Turpin executed at York Tyburn in 1739. And these images attest to the enduring fascination with the highway robber, who, of course, most more often uh, was a common and violent thugs who operated on foot rather than on horse, operated on foot on the king or the queen's highway. And in culture and in the public imagination, they were cast in much more dramatic, heroic and romantic ways, helped by images like this. 
um, and cloaked very much by the Robin Hood myth, which itself was quite problematic in terms of mythologizing. However, perhaps the most interesting criminal portrait from the 18th century was that of Jack or John Shepherd on the left of the slide. He was a thief who would become a criminal celebrity for his four escapes from prison and subsequent rearrests. And most notable was his final escape from the strong room of Newgate Prison, after which he became so celebrated that high society would pay the jailer to come and gawk at him. And Jack would actually perform the various elements of his escape story to his audience as a petition from several prominent people calling for his death sentence to be commuted to transportation, stated the concourse of people of tolerable fashion to see him was exceeding great. He was always cheerful and pleasant to a degree as turning almost everything, as was said, into a jest and banter. Now, in this period and this painting we see in front of us, Shepherd would be painted by the society and court painter James Fornhill. In the painting from 1724, Jack with the bricks of the prison cell walls behind him seems poised for flight. Unfortunately for Jack, the only place he would be going from this cell was to Tyburn, where he was executed on the 16th of November of that year. Interestingly, Thornhill was the father-in-law of a much more famous artist, William Hogarth, and both men would visit Newgate in 1733 to see the 22-year-old Sarah Malcolm on your right of the, of the picture. Uh, Sarah was a servant girl who was condemned to death for her involvement in a burglary and murder of three women. Hogarth would sketch and paint her, as we see here, just days before uh, execution. And both of these images can be found on the National Portrait Gallery website. So clearly both Hogarth and Thornhill were not, a, not above exploiting the notoriety of their sitters. Although at least in Shepherd's case, there's some sense that he colluded with the portrait painter as he points towards what is presumably the way out of the cell. Now in the next part of the presentation, I'd like to turn to how the earliest criminal mugshots and photographs were used by uh, pseudoscientists and criminologists in order to demonstrate their theories of criminality to a public who sought to identify and recognize potential criminals in the rapidly urbanizing spaces of the 19th century city. So pseudoscience and picturing criminals. So in the 19th century, the visual image of the criminal would become much more common. The criminal could be pictured through a number of forms. So as we've already seen, the execution broadsides, which continued until at least the mid 19th century, cheap press and popular literature, and the mugshots, of course, from the mid 19th century. But the criminal image would also be used in other contexts. Pseudoscientists would draw on early visual images of the criminal, their research shaped by contemporary fears about crime and rationalized by the need to identify and surveil the poor. And as early as the late 18th century, the Swiss poet, philosopher and pastor Johann Caspar Lavater was one of the key proponents of the science of physiognomy, which along with phrenology would be influential in Europe in the, from the late 18th and early 19th centuries. And here we have a set of, um, on the pictures, profiles from Lavater and on the uh, right of the picture, a satirical image of the German father of phrenology, Franz Josef Gull, and that's um, from 1808 by the cartoonist Thomas Rowlandson. In 1783, Lavater would publish his, publish his research on facial fragments, concluding that criminal behavior could be determined through an examination of the shape of the face and features, hence psychological traits of violence and delinquency could literally be found in certain features and body morphology. Whilst both physiognomy and phrenology, the study of the skull, skull to predict mental traits, were largely discredited in the early decades of the 19th century, their influence lingered in the work of two key individuals who would use the new techniques of photography in their fundamentally pseudoscientific work. So the first of these was Francis Galton, the Victorian polymath, cousin of Charles Darwin, 
and founding father of eugenics. In the 1870s, he capitalized on the growth of photographic record keeping in the criminal justice system by using mugshots of various groups of criminals to create his composite portraits of criminal types. And he used a series of photographs of prisoners at Pentonville and Millbank prisons, Millbank prison, which were provided to him by the Home Office in 1877. And he used a technique where he superimposed limited repeat exposures of public photographs of different prisoners who had committed the same crime, with the aim of seeing whether he could identify a recognizable criminal type. In fact, what he ended up finding was that by layering the repeated exposures, it meant that the individual portraits of the criminals, which may have had specific features, tended to just blend into normality. Nevertheless, these images are very powerful, and you can see the um, images from the Galton Archive on the left of the screen there. They tell us much about contemporary fears about crime in mid to late 19th century Europe. As Daniel Pick explored brilliantly in his, in his book, Faces of Degeneration, that was published in 1993, from around 1848 to 1918, theories of degeneration gained hold in European countries and fitted neatly with the parallel emergence of surveillance, surveillance systems that sought to identify and recognize the criminal, the deviant and the insane. Now, undoubtedly influenced by Galton was at the same time challenging many of his findings. The Italian criminologist Cesare Lombroso would develop a theory of criminal atavism. So again, using the studies of criminal faces, and we can see here, the other two images are both from Galton um, Lombroso's work. So using studies of criminal faces, as well as post-mortem examinations, he claimed that there were specific physical anomalies, which indicated that criminals were primitive and subhuman, characterized by features that were reminiscent of apes and lower primates. His book, Le Humo Delinquent, was published in Italian in 1876 with the English translation, The Criminal Man, published in 1911 after Lombroso's death in 1909. Another book, The Criminal Woman, had been published earlier in English in 1895. But during the later 19th century, Lombroso had a worldwide reputation. And I think this work is really important in helping us to think about the visual imagery of crime and criminality, both in the 19th century and going into the 20th century. So Victorian and Edwardian mugshots. So this work developed in parallel with the growing use of the mugshot in European countries from the 1840s. And in England, police were photographing criminals in London, Liverpool and Birmingham, as we've already heard from Corinne's presentation. So whilst these images were a reflection of new photographic technology, and the evolution of police record keeping and surveillance system, it's tempting sometimes to see them as a nat natural next step from the criminal portraiture, such as the work of artists like Hogarth and Fornell, or depictions of criminals in broadsheets and execution woodcut woodcuts. And these sorts of depictions existed within a popular culture of folk devil and crime celebrity. Indeed, particularly notorious criminals like the Sheffield burglar and police killer Charlie Peace were familiar to the public through photographs and drawings in newspapers and petty publications, as were other violent offenders who went to the gallows in the 19th and early 20th century. However, the new photographic image as Im images of criminals from the mid 19th century, as we've seen, became very much fodder for the search for the criminal other. So these photographs would not have been accessible to ordinary people. They were part of that private criminal record. And the people who we see in the mugshot books, which have been rediscovered through digitization and shared via the internet in the last decade or so, did not have the enduring fame that Peace or his predecessors like Jack Shepard had. These are the mostly ordinary men, women and children caught on camera for a fleeting moment, creating an indelible but compelling record, a snapshot in their lives. 
While some individuals caught and recorded in mugshot books were serial offenders, most were not. Most had ordinary lives that reached both before and after their interaction with the criminal justice system. And it's important to remember, and I think Corrine mentioned this, it's important to remember that people in police arrest mugshots specifically were also sometimes acquitted of crimes. Hence, these historical mugshots show the accused, not necessarily the guilty. Now, perhaps this is most notable in the mugshots of young delinquents, often accused of very petty offences, such as petty larceny, or as we've seen, vagrancy, or other very low-level misdemeanours. So when we look at the faces of brothers George and Joseph Green, aged 12 and 14, sentenced to one month hard labour in Oxford prison around 1872 for stealing a bag containing bread and butter, their frank and resigned gaze stares out at us. It's, it's hard not to read into the images and imagine the fragmented and difficult lives these brothers may have gone on to live. But interestingly, the brothers were also sentenced to four years in a reformatory school. And we know from our research, research by historians, that in this period, because of the supportive aftercares that saw former inmates into employment, they were much less likely to reoffend after their release. So actually, these boys may have gone on to live quite unremarkable lives away from the criminal justice system. So this is a reminder that the mugshot only reveals a glimpse of a life. And as much as we might feel empathy and feel to seek to fill in the gaps, they tell us nothing of the life lived by the individual beyond that moment. So in conclusion, I need to think, I think, sorry, we need to think more about how we use these images and how we read and interpret them. And Helen's gonna say a little more about the ethics of the mugshots in our work as historians. As I've briefly shown in this presentation, the face of the accused and the criminal has been caught and used by, for different purposes by artists and photographers. Some of the criminal fo criminals photographed could be argued to have at least some agency. So Jack Shepard acted out his escapes to an enthralled audience, although he still went to the gallows. Charlie Peace gained a sort of criminal celebrity in his lifetime, but again ended his life hanged at Armley Jail in Leeds. More recent criminals, like the Cray Twins, caught here by the celebrity photographer David Bailey in 1965, arguably used their image in their crest for a form of criminal celebrity before their arrest in 1968 and life imprisonment the following year. But the individuals we see in the criminal mugshot or the photographs manipulated by Galton, Lombroso and their contemporaries show powerful images of individuals in their momentary interaction with the criminal justice system. As Jonathan Finn noted in his 2009 book, Capturing the Criminal Image, by the close of the 19th century, the photographic representation of the criminal body was enmeshed in a socially defined binary of normal versus deviant, and in questions of power, surveillance, and privacy. And I'd like to end it there, thanks. Thank you very much, Heather, for that thought-provoking presentation. I think it takes a really, really interesting alternative view of portraiture, uh, which you've taken through criminal celebrity, phrenology, atavism, and to mugshots as the natural next step. And I think it's important that, that um, as you say, mugshots don't have that enduring fame. It, it's a moment in time and they weren't necessarily guilty. Um, and also the often unnoted aftercare, you know, what, what happened um, to, to those criminals, so, or not criminals. So my next um, uh, speaker is uh, Professor Helen Johnson. And Helen is Programme Director of the MA in Criminal Justice and Crime Control. And she's also co-director of the Centre for Criminal and Criminal Justice at the University of Hull. Helen's paper is entitled Ethics, Photography and the Victorian Edwardian Criminal Justice System. Thank you, Helen. Thank you, Angie. Thank you. Um, and I suppose in this presentation, I'd like to kind of pick up on quite a few things that um, have been mentioned 
um, along the way and hopefully to pick up on some of um, the discussion um, in the chat and um, and continue some of these themes into our into the uh, round table session. So yes, yeah, so today I'm going to talk about arresting images, ethics, photography and the Victorian Edwardian criminal justice system. Um, so a few years ago, um, Heather and I um, began to collaborate um, and we started collaborating uh, through the construction of a research network called Our Criminal Past. And the idea of our criminal past was really to reach out from um, the university, from academia, uh, to collaborate and engage with people who were working in archives, museums and the heritage sector, particularly um, those uh, within the area of um, crime history, police history, uh, prison history. Um, so what we created from um, 2013 onwards uh, was a series of network seminars um, aimed to bring people together in order to think about and raise questions about um, some of um, our shared concerns um, and uh, research interests relating to the history of crime and punishment. So we began this network, our criminal past, caring for the future, of our criminal past, um, involving uh, curators um, in uh, various uh, network activities, but also trying to get people to engage in um, our then website, uh, in blogging about particular collections that they had or activities that they were doing in their um, museums, and trying to develop um, a network of sustained relationships um, between um, uh, academics within um, crime history, law, sociology um, and related areas um, and those people working in the heritage sector. So we're very keen on building collaboration, relationships across disciplines um, and also um, thinking about how we engage with the public about understanding, um, presenting and preserving our criminal past. Um, after this uh, successful uh, research network uh, for a couple of years, we were then able to secure a little bit more funding uh, for a project which we then called Our Criminal Ancestors. Um, we have a website out there called Our Criminal Ancestors uh, and the, the aim of this particular project was um, to continue to collaborate with um, archives, museums, heritage sector, but also to think more directly about how we worked with the public uh, and for the public in terms of delivering a range of different public engagement activities. Um, so in particular, our partner for um, these, this venture uh, was Hull History Centre. And to start with, we delivered three workshops um, during the City of Culture year in 2017 in Hull. Uh, and we laid on uh, a number of different workshops. We had um, curators, people from museums come along, as well as expert talks about various aspects of criminal ancestors. You know, how do I find my police ancestor? Where do I start, you know, with uh, prison records or um, those kinds of things, as well as hands-on sessions that we're looking at um, documents. In the process of this, we also developed a um, website uh, and a source guide. Um, so I'll point you to the website there. You can find out lots more information. You can also find blogs, articles, newsletters. Um, and we really wanted to encourage people to engage with us um, about um, you know, how they'd gone about finding out their criminal ancestors and the interesting things that they'd found, the problems that they found, and also um, some of the ethical issues. So really, we come to this um, from um, the last few years of beginning to talk to both the heritage sector and the public about some of these, um, these issues. So one of our first themes in the um, Our Criminal Past Network was digitization and criminal photography. 
it was a concern of um, a number of people at that um, network event that actually the digitization of criminal records had led to this proliferation of um, mugshots um, that were posted in various forms of social media. So whether they were on Flickr, whether they're on people um, collection websites, that kind of thing. And of course they provide this wonderfully um, engaging um, image of um, the criminal uh, that draws the eye and draws the um, interest to, um, to the particular feature. And indeed, that is also why we used uh, those images within our um, uh, publicity um, as well. Um, but as we saw in the example um, this morning, there's a whole range of different scenarios in which these um, these photographs were, um, were taken. So here we can see this um, photograph here of um, Thomas Bell. Um, he has his hands up to see whether he has any um, tattoos on his hands, when he has any missing digits, etc. We've got the use of the um, mirror here so we can get a side profile um, of him. And these visually engaging um, images draw the eye to um, uh, to the uh, topic of interest. Um, so a whole host of archives have began to put these criminal um, images on, um, on social media. So Tyne and Weir were the ones that I used in my opening um, slide, Tyne and Weir's collection on Flickr. Um, there's also um, a collection uh, via Aberdeen archives as well that I draw your attention to, and a lot of work by Phil Astley, the curator, uh, the curator there, um, in relation to that. Um, and of course, from our point of view of working with the public, one of the most frequent questions that we were asked during the workshop was not only how do I find out more about my ancestor and do you think there are any records, you know, in this prison or about this or something like that, was do you think there's a photograph in that record? Um, so the thing that would provide for most family historians looking back, um, the important possibility of a photograph, um, a photograph that might not otherwise be available of, um, of their ancestor. So I suppose what we have is a number of different competing tensions about the use of some of these um, images. Kareen um, mentioned, as did Heather um, earlier, about when exactly the photograph was taken. So many photographs were taken by the police, as has already been um, indicated. That might be when somebody has been um, arrested. Um, but in a number of cases, as we know with the criminal justice system today, those cases might not have been proceeded with. Somebody could have been found um, innocent. Um, there are a number of different um, processes going on um, at the same time. Um, but the way often the way in which that they are presented is that these people are automatically criminals. Okay, so I'll come back to, uh, to some conclusions about this um, later on. We then have a whole collection of um, photographs that are taken on entry to prison system. Um, and prison authorities went to huge lengths to record details, meticulous details about the people who were going into their institutions. Um, we know that this happened as early as 1840. If you, in the 1840s, if you look at um, Richard Ireland's study of um, Carmarthen Prison, then the, govern, uh, the governor at that prison was a keen photographer. And so he was quite early in documenting um, prisoners uh, within that locality. Um, but the prison authorities and the entry of the government into, um, into the administration of prisons via the um, convict prison system also led to a proliferation of these different types of documents. So um, a penal record, many of which have been um, digitized and placed on um, ancestry and find my past. 
Um, you can find meticulous details of the um, individual, their height, their weight, any identifying features, their health at the time, whether or not they'd been vaccinated, if they'd had any particular diseases, as well as these identifying features. And as um, Heather has already uh, uh, noted earlier, all of this was in the pursuit really of trying to identify and survey um, the criminal classes or the habitual criminal. Um, in particular, they were concerned to identify um, the repeat offender, the recidivist. Um, in addition, um, we also have a whole range of other different types of sources that were merely compiled locally by different police forces who might well have used different systems and different practices. So, for example, we have um, examples across the country of um, town thieves books, for example, which were much more about kind of local offenders, identifying people. Some had photographs, um, some didn't. Um, but I think the also, um, so we've mentioned already about the Prevention of Crimes Act, the Habitual um, Criminals Act, and how this, um, I suppose, reasserted uh, and required the use of photography within the criminal justice system to identify and surveil um, offenders and their contact um, with the police and the prison system. But I think the also, also the other thing to bear in mind about this is that, um, these, when these um, images were produced, um, they were not in the public sphere. They were for use by criminal justice agencies. They were shared by criminal justice agencies, but they certainly weren't in the public domain. Um, and as we've um, already seen, it was perhaps only illustrations and things like that that would uh, feature in newspapers when it came to high profile criminal, criminal trials. So I think there's an interesting kind of tension there between the fact that these were never public um, images at the time, but they are now dispersed in the public sphere across social media in a different way in which they were originally created. Um, okay, I think the other um, tension is um, one about when the, uh, the photograph was um, taken. It can, of course, be quite a distressing experience to be arrested, to be detained and perhaps to be um, imprisoned. And across many collections, you can find the occasional image um, of people who are clearly in some kind of distress um, at their situation uh, or they're responding, resisting. Um, in this particular image, um, this uh, offender here looks, you know, quite uncomfortable, quite tense. His hands are clenched together. Um, this is from a collection um, online via the Welcome Collection from uh, Wakefield Prison. Um, but we can see that this is an uncomfortable forced position um, and, you know, there are images around um, from the criminal justice system that are particularly um, distressing. So I think it's also important to remember that, you know, arrest can sometimes happen quite shortly after a crime. That might be offenders, suspects might be quite um, emotional, upset, fearful. Um, still in drink, for example, um, distressed not only at being caught, but perhaps at the events that have, uh, have occurred. Um, so I think that's also something that we, um, we ought to bear in, in mind. Um, and again, the same goes for, um, for the prison system, really. Entry to the prison system, we know um, from historical evidence, but from contemporary evidence about the prison system today, that going to prison can be a very difficult and stressful time. Um, if we look, for example, at prison suicides and self-harm, um, the rates of which have increased um, quite a lot in recent years, um, certainly with regard to self-harm, we know that entry to the prison as an institution can be a very distressing time and a difficult time not only, for example, for people coming to terms with, you know, having to face a sentence of incarceration, um, you know, broken relationships, perhaps, um, as well as coming to terms with the fact that 
um, they have um, committed uh, some kind of crime. And this might also be additionally the case if we're thinking about individuals who are quite young or who are suffering from mental health issues. Okay. Um, so some of the photos that exist are really um, quite, uh, quite distressing. But I think the other thing to mention um, that we've talked about, uh, that's mentioned a little bit this morning already, is the fact that the overwhelming majority of people who came into the criminal justice system were committing um, quite low level offences. Um, and so they weren't necessarily all recorded um, in this way. Um, it kind of varies, um, again, on uh, different local practices. Okay, so um, I suppose what I'd like to do in conclusion is just to raise a few questions about um, what do we, you know, what do we do in forms of um, practice in terms of thinking about exhibiting the archive? Um, do we think, for example, about um, more explanations of photographs? Um, do we think about recording whether or not somebody was found guilty and convicted or whether or not they were in fact um, innocent or set free? Um, is that a way in which we can kind of mitigate against um, some of these uh, tensions? Um, for over where, um, I think the other thing to remember is that for most people who came in contact with the criminal justice system, it might um, some of those people um, would have found that um, compelling political um, activists. I'm thinking, for example, this illustration of um, a suffragette being force fed. Um, they might have seen that as an important part of their life, an important part of the contribution that they made to um, uh, women uh, gaining the vote or whatever political activity they were involved in. But for the most people, contact with the criminal justice system was a momentary event. Um, it was something that um, might not have defined their lives in any way. And we ought to be careful about defining their lives um, by the fact that we only have evidence of their, cri their criminal activity. And we don't have um, wider evidence um, of the whole of their lives. Um, and I think the other thing to think about, and I think this was mentioned as well, is, you know, um, offences in the past that are not offences today. Um, in a way, I think people feel that that sits more comfortably. We can kind of explain that when we're displaying and presenting um, material about that. However, there's a real tension there about stigma, about the stigma that's attached to offences that happened hundreds of years ago, but also about stigma today and the way in which we um, view people's um, criminal histories, criminal backgrounds, and how indeed people um, are able to move on and move away from um, the association with um, criminality um, in their lives. Uh, Helen, thank you for that 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 amazing overview. Firstly, of our criminal just uh, our criminal past and our criminal ancestors, I think we are both really important projects in that they made some connections between academic research and heritage collections and and people. It's really important and family history, um, but also highlight the critical points around the use of images and exhibiting the archive. Um, uh, as you say, it was a momentary event, and, and yet the, the stigma is, is hereditary and continues. Um, so I think having listened to the all five presentations today, um, uh, an overriding theme that's, that sort of emerged from the questions is around consent and legacy, and um, that there have been uh, a few questions about that, not that we've all had time to answer so I thought I would just a good way of opening up the discussion would be to return to one that's in the chat that we haven't had time to answer from um, Emmeline Godfrey um, who has asked about resistance uh, and she's put in brackets to authority through the mugshot which makes these images um, distinctive as mugshots um, and, and she's asking if the for instance, the photo of Evelyn Manster was taken by force. Um, so I think that's a really good question to sort of 
kick off on um, and and I just sort of opening it up to the panel that that that, that whole theme of of resistance consents and 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 legacy who'd, who'd like to start off on that yeah Helen um well I suppose for most people who entered the criminal justice system they were you know they <laughs> They didn't really have any choice about having their photograph ta taken, so they weren't consenting to it. Um, and certainly there are plenty of images, you know, um, suffragettes is one um, example of um, people uh, resisting uh, their photograph being taken. And there are some images around um, that you can find um, of that. Uh, but you know, the prevailing thing is that people weren't consenting, were they? It was a result of their contact with the criminal justice system. Um, and so I suppose the different levels of resistance might be um, uh, might be shown in different images. But for a group like the suffragettes, of course, that was, a you know, a wider symbol about their own, you know, resistance to the strategies of um, the government and the police, etc. Um, at the time. Yeah, Heather. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I, yeah, because because I know, like, when Corinne was talking about the um, the sort of um, quiet, the, the the image taken from the police counter. You, you said about people refusing to have their images, and I suppose that's what I thought that you you probably couldn't refuse to have your photo taken because of that issue. You you haven't really got that uh, consent, like Helen says. The thing that I was quite interested in, but always interested me with the very early photos, so the, the photos that uh, Corrine showed and other very early mug shots that I've seen is, of course, this is probably the first time those people were actually photographed. And it might be the last time, you know, no, most ordinary people in those early years in the 40s and 50s and that wouldn't have been photographed, you know. Um, so it's sort of interesting to see how, yeah, how, how, I mean, we can only read into this, but to think about how they might have responded to that, to that technology, to have their, to having their image captured, were some of them actually quite um, frightened of that, you know, when they were sort of resisting, was it a political resistance like we see later perhaps with the suffragettes, or was it a resistance of fear? Certainly some of the ones that I've seen of the um, lunatic asylum mugshots, which we haven't particularly talked about, um, understandably, you know, people, they're, they're being caught at this moment when people are in a, you know, really heightened uh, distress because of um, you know, the, both the situation they're in and their, their, their specific mental health issues. Um, so it's, it's sort of interesting to think, particularly in that era when um, photography wasn't something that was accessible to most people. And it is interesting in terms of, you know, the history of photography, that a, a good core of the images of ordinary people that we have in the, the mid to sort of late 19th century are of... Um, you know, offenders or people who have been accused of offenders for, for, for this reason. So yeah, it's it, 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 it'd be interesting, I think, to sort of really compare the photos over time, um, a little bit like Kareem was doing, you know, and following the fashions, but also sort of seeing, get, is there any sense of how, whether you can read into the pictures of how people were responding to the camera? Yeah, but, hey, that might just be me being fancy. <laughs> I'm gonna I'm gonna ask Corinne on that, but but I mean just just from my experience of, of curating a police museum, we had a, a what what we called the mug shot chair in the collection, mm -hmm. which was a very sturdy wooden chair on a turntable, um, but quite intriguingly had sort of manacles on the arms and a great big um, clamp up the back, which clamped the person's head in place. So I think that speaks volumes about resistance. <laughs> But uh, Corinne, do you have any thoughts on on this? Yeah, well, I mean, that that chair would probably provoke more discussion and more emotions from people than the images of of people actually sitting in the chair. <laughs> we, we've got a handful of pictures in our collection of people who have refused to consent for the photo and they've been held down um, generally by an officer standing behind them with the, the arm under the throat, just holding them in position. So we've got a few of them and we don't tend to use them. I, I'd always be cautious of the, the 
negative connotations. You know, if I put something like that out on social media, I'm going to get a load of abuse back about police nowadays, police brutality, all that kind of stuff. So when when we put stuff out, we've always got to consider the reputation of West Midlands Police because we're not a standalone museum. We're part of a police force. So everything we do is about engaging with the public in a positive way, hopefully. Um, so we don't tend to use them um, for that reason, but actually uh, in producing the most recent photography display for our, our new museum, I have actually used one of those images just to, to show the differences that actually it wasn't all straightforward. People didn't always stand still. Um, and I think someone else said a little while ago about when, um, it, you know, in those early methods of photography you had to stand still for quite some time to actually get the image to take so some some people just just wouldn't do that and this is what the police had to do it's not it's not defending the police action and defending any kind of aggression um i, I would never consider photoshopping one of those images and and removing the arm which i think that was mentioned in the chat around a suffragette image where where that's been so i'd, I'd never do that and try and alter the truth but i think it's like the mugshots themselves it's it's a statement of fact. It's something that happened, and and this is why it happened. So it's it's about sharing that that perhaps uncomfortable message. Mm, absolutely, yes. Fiona, I know it's it's um it's it's quite difficult to make connections connections between the then and now. But um, this is obviously so, you know we we it was really important that you were here today to um, contribute a voice to um people who are currently going through the criminal justice system and the images they have i, I don't know if there's anything you'd like to add at, at this point around around that um i think when you were talking about the ethics of display and, and everyone is really saying the same thing which is it's kind of to do with the context and if you can give more of the context um or more of the information. It was interesting what was said about the person who asked that it was noted that the person was acquitted. Yeah. Um, so because we deal with people who are fully involved with us and submit their work, it's obviously much easier for, for us. It's, we're in a unique position. Um, and I think the more of that original voice that you can put into things, obviously, the better. So it was wonderful um, to have Sarah, Sarah was here today in terms of we brought her in and she did the interview with me. Um, and I think as much as possible, you know, Kersler always tries to put that voice into a conversation, whether it's on the wall or in our governance, on our board, steering groups um so that wider context is important too just how some how decisions are made and also who who perhaps leads exhibitions or has the last word or who might be brought into an exhibition guide who might be asked um to give some feedback or to contribute something to an exhibition um i think widening that as much as possible and asking where you can widen it's really important mm. thank you I think, sorry, Angie, just chipping in there with yeah. Fiona. There's, um, I guess the interesting thing there, and obviously I think we were probably all impressed by how, this sounds awful, you know, but, you know, how articulate Sarah was about her practice and about her experience. Um, not that there's no reason why she shouldn't be, but, you know, I think we all make assumptions. But it seemed to me that particularly one of the things about the Kersler artists, and particularly where they have done their own portraits, is um, about their agency. And that's something, you know, I talked about very briefly in relation to perhaps some of the, you know, the Jack Shepard portrait and that perhaps sometimes people do have a sort of agency if they perform in a sort of way in, in a photograph or in your case, they're choosing to have this, you know, develop this medium to be able to show their journey that they went through and express their feelings about their encounter with the criminal justice system. So I guess that historically, most of our people you know, most of these people didn't have agency. And I guess what's different today is your organisation helps them to have that agency. Would that would, would you agree with that? Yeah, yeah, as much as possible. We're yeah, definitely there to to show that. And a lot of our entrants are very aware of scrutiny or stereotypes of people in prisons or going through a criminal justice system in general. 
we get a lot of artwork that's made of collages of like tabloid newspaper features, for example. So mm -hmm. our engines are extremely aware of it, maybe more aware than, than anyone else, you know, of how you are viewed and therefore taking control of how you are viewed, whether it's through a poem or a self-portrait that you present of yourself is mm -hmm. extremely important. Thank you. We have actually um, a question from Richard in the chat, um, which he's asking, has any work been done on how many photographs survive today? Um, he's saying, I think there are over 100,000 habitual criminals based on the numbers allocated to them by letters, many of whom have been photographed. Um, but this is only a small percentage of offenders. Is anyone aware, those who uh, have researched collections, is anyone aware if any research has been done around that? No. No, it, I think it just varies as to, mm. there are, there are a, a lot of places have got mugshot books, whether they're um, police mugshot books that get, um, you know, handed into museums or archives, or whether they're um, prison mugshots. The um, often some of the problem is, and um, Kareen may have experienced this, is they can't always get the. I mean, obviously, Kareen, you managed to get the funding to digitise them, but I've spoke to a couple of smaller museums that didn't have that funding to digitise. And again, Jackie, you know, this might be something you know about in relation to, you know, you work with the um, the um, Museum of London, so you know obviously sort of bigger organizations may have that money but um it is it can be quite an expensive process to get digitized so i suppose it's a combination of the survival what survives uh, what's accessible and if they do survive can can they be made accessible and i suppose the other question is should they but we're sort of past that aren't we because they're mm. out there mm. Mm. Yeah, I was just going to say, um, I think that's really interesting about the collections because we are very much talking about the, the mugshots in inverted commas. And I'm really interested, where does, where does, what's the origin of mugshot? And is that, you know, it's an interesting term in itself, isn't it? Um, but I think it's also thinking about other collections. And, and I suppose because I was coming to it as a curator, sort of more social historian side, it was, I, that's where I found things like the, um, the Hartley collection, fascinating, because I didn't realise that those sort of sketches, I mean, you know the, the images that appeared in the Finnish newspapers, but actually seeing sketches that were like that, little portraits that were done of people, and that brought those personalities of those people in much more than something like a mugshot. And I wonder if, A, if there are, and I don't know, if there are more collections like that of those sorts of courtroom sketches, mm -hmm. uh, which are much more informal in some ways, and... Um, are, um, and sometimes informative the people I don't know um, and also then I suppose there's also things like the um, you know the the busts the heads the the uh, that, that 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 again there are quite large collections around the country of so I suppose it's layering up the different types of cri crime or criminal portraiture that we have access to and, and that would mm. be fascinating in itself as well so not just taking the mug shots isolated but putting them in a context of these other types of, um, of images. Um, yeah. A bit like you were talking about with Charlie Peace, where the, there are the kind of the images of him, um, but if you then saw a photograph or something, you know, how, how, they, um, how they compare as well, I think. Yeah. yeah. I mean, those, those images of Charlie Peace are massively, there's massive variation. He goes from looking quite sort of yeah. um, monstrous to looking relatively yeah. normal. And then there's also a sort of, I can't remember what comic it is, there's a comic strip from the early 20th century, something like Roy of, the, Roy of the Rovers or something like that, where they do a whole comic strip about him again. Um, so his image has been reproduced and reproduced, but really probably doesn't look that much like the original man, if you know. Yeah, absolutely. Um, yeah. yeah. I've got actually an, uh, a question uh, in the Q&A from Alexa Neal. Um, don't you think there's a danger in re, uh, redacting some Im images and not others, even if they're contentious or show people in distress, redaction creates a corpus of consent, surely? I worry that taking out certain images leaves behind all the Myra, Hin all the Myra Hindleys and Ian Brady's, for example, which tells people this is what a criminal looks like. And by extension, this person doesn't look like a criminal, which is likely to disadvantage some groups more than others. So that's a, 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 a question from Alexa. I don't know if anyone... Yes, Helen. Um, I don't think I was suggesting that, 
you remove anything necessarily. I I agree with what Alex is saying in the sense that you know we should, if we are choosing to display something, then we should choose to look at the range of experience that people had um, in that situation. Um, so so yeah, I, but so, and some of those Im images are quite uncomfortable and make us uncomfortable, but. Mm. But then do we just ignore things that make us uncomfortable? Mm. You know, got, I don't think that's yeah. right either, really. <laughs> Whose hand out was think, uh, oh sorry, we got Corin and Heather wanting to Corinne, do yeah. you want to go first? Go on. Corin. Yeah, I was just gonna say if that if that um that question might have been in relation to me saying that we, we didn't use images, we don't tend to use images of people that are um restrained, which from my knowledge of our collection, if we've got eight or 9,000 images, the ones that are restrained, there's probably five or six of them. So it's it's a very, very small percentage. Uh, and it's just a case of when we flick through the images, we make conscious decisions all the time of which ones not to use because some of them are blurry. Um, so probably those people were, were moving possibly. Um, some of them are faded more than others. Um, and, and, and we also choose not to use the ones uh, of people who have been found not guilty as well. So, so we do make decisions. I, I do appreciate the point. Um, and I think it is very, very dangerous to go down that route of suggesting what a criminal might look like. Mm. Um, but no, I think it, it is a valid point. Yeah. Heather, could you just wind up quickly as we're, we're running out of time now? Um, yeah, sure. Yeah. It was just to Alexa's point, really, which I think mm. is really interesting and sort of I mean, obviously, one of the things to, uh, you know, the, the more notorious cases like the Brady and Hindley, we know so much more about them, you know, in terms of contextualizing that crime and affecting the way we think about it, as opposed to like looking at the sort of average Victorian mugshots, where often there's just a one word or one line description of their crime. I think though we, we need to be really aware of how of our subjectivities in terms of how we look at them, even when we have this knowledge. I don't know if, you know, this week that the awful and um, tragic murder of the little boy and the mugshot that was used of his of his stepmother. And you still I still find myself looking at it and thinking, oh, you know, she's got that, there's a, you know, I could feel it. A, she's got a particular look, you know, so we're still, I think, very susceptible to thinking about those, you know, thinking to reading into images. And that's not, I'm not saying, you know, I'm not saying anything about uh, behaviour, you know, but just in terms of how we still respond to those images, even when we've got this knowledge as researchers or curators or whatever, I think it just really underlines how powerful they can be. Um, um, and I think, you know, yeah, there's there's not a sort of easy answer to, to how we use mm -hmm. them. Thank you. Right, so I'm going to start to wind up here. We said it would be just a little bit past two, so we're doing, we're pretty much on time. Um, so just to conclude, um, I said the at the beginning, the webinar has been recorded um, and both UPG and CAP will be posting the film on their respective websites. Um, just as a reminder before you leave, this has been a free event. Um, and I know feedback is a chore, but it is so crucial to these events. And um, uh, we obviously can't hand you a physical form before you leave, but I, I think we will be sending you out um, feedback forms. So please do fill it in. It, it's short, it's, it's concise, it won't take long. And so just last thank yous um, from Heather and I as the chair, as joint chairs to our panelists, Heather, Helen Johnson, Corin Brazier, Jackie Keeley, Fiona Current, Heather, can you thank yourself? Um, <laughs> um, and um, for, for, for and also for Sarah for her input as well for their fantastic and stimulating contributions, and of course to all our attendees for joining us. Thank you all. Yes, thank you.